Quite often I get asked, what was a normal day in the life of a mobster? What did it look like? Well, it was anything but normal, but I'm gonna tell you what it was like. Hey everybody, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. How is everybody doing? It's uh, Christmas season. Hope you're getting your shopping done under whatever restrictions we have. I think all the online retailers are doing a lot better than the uh, uh, brick and mortar stores this year, but I think that's been a trend that's happening anyway. Uh, but anyway, I hope you're getting into the spirit, you know, fighting your way through this. Uh, things are gonna get better, but let the Christmas spirit just take you over. And, uh, you know, just just make you feel good. That's it. That's what we're trying to do here at the Franzi's household. So uh, before I get going today, I've uh, been getting a lot of inquiries about my books uh, because you see me read from one yesterday. I uh, just want to tell you quickly what I got. A lot of people are asking about Christmas presents. And once again, uh, I got four books right now. Blood Covenant, my life story, TV series based upon this is in uh, development next year, we hope. Um, let's this, I'll make you an offer you can't refuse, my business book, great book, it's all about Machiavellian ideology, Proverbs ideology, uh, it was translated I think in 10 different countries, bestsellers list in three Asian countries, and people have loved it, so you'll like that. Um, my wife's book, This Thing of Ours, her story, you know, better than mine I think, so uh, if you want to get that, I always tell the guys at a men's group, hey, when you see what my wife went through to stay with me, you let your wife read this, she's going to think you're terrific. Trust me. Um, so that's that. And then, honestly, people, my favorite book, uh, there was a documentary done on this, but uh, God the Father. And uh, I really put my heart in this one. It's a ministry tool. Anybody that really needs encouragement, you know, uh, feeling hopelessness, it, it's my story, but in a little bit more detail. And um, again, I put my heart in this one. So anybody that's struggling, this is the book. I got thousands of these in prisons all over the country. So, and it's been effective having an impact. Store.michaelfrancis.com, or you can go on Facebook, Instagram. You can pull it up there and buy it. So that's that. Now, what are we going to do today? So many of you ask me, Mike, what's life like as a mobster? I mean, describe a day in the life of a mobster. Well, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do that in three different phases because. I was never an associate. You know, associate is somebody that's kind of hanging around a made guy. I, don't, I shouldn't say hanging around, but supportive of a made guy. He's never was made. Maybe we, he might get made if he's proposed. Who knows? But I was never an associate. I immediately became an, a, a recruit because my father repro, uh, proposed me. So it's a recruit, a soldier, once you get made. And then uh, for me, it was a cop regime, capo, skipper, street boss, okay, all of those. So I'm going to describe my life in each one of those phases of me being a mobster. As a recruit, I think I've told you this, but there's a lot of new people that tune in. So if I'm a little bit redundant, I'll get through it quickly. Um, as a recruit, once my father proposed me to the family, I go downtown, a captain in the family, Capo picks me up, takes me to see the boss. At that time was Tom DeBella and a fellow by the name of Andrew Russo, who was my first Capo regime. And uh, Tom runs this down to me, Michael, I got a message from your father. He said, you want to be a made member of that life, is, of our life. Is that true? I said, yes. Here's the deal. From now on, 24-7, you're on call to serve this family, 24-7. That means if your mother is sick and dying and you're called to service, you leave your mother's side, come and serve us from now on. We're number one in your life before anything and everything. When and if we feel you deserve the privilege to become a member, we'll let you know. That's what you, you're told as a recruit. Andrew looks at me and he says, be tomorrow at Carroll Street. That's where our social club was and kind of our headquarters at that time for the Colombo family. He should be there in the morning, wear a suit. So as a recruit, my day every day was going downtown to Carroll Street most of the time or to wherever I was designated to go. And um, I would just sit around and see what was uh, needed of me uh, I observed, I learned as a recruit, uh, quite often I drove the boss around and, uh, and my couple at that time, 
because uh, I always had a nice car. I was in the car business during that time, even though I was young. I had a leasing company and I had a body shop and I always had a good car that I was driving. So they would like me to drive them. But uh, I didn't really drive them. I would sit in the back seat. Uh, Andrew would drive and Tom DeBella would sit in the passenger seat. And I'd just sit there by my own business, not say a word and listen. You know, I, I got to mention this again. Some of you have heard this. But that scene in Donnie Brasco, OK, when, when uh, Lefty Ruggiero, uh, Al Pacino was sitting in the car smoking and Joe Pistone, the Johnny Depp character, opens the window because the car is filled with smoke. And uh, I'll never forget, you know, uh, Pacino turns to him and say, uh, Donnie, shut that window. You want to kill me with that draft, Donnie? You want to kill me? Donnie, what are you doing? What are you doing with that? Put the fuck. Donnie, you want to kill me with that draft? You know how many times I heard that? Couldn't open the window. I never smoked, but they used to smoke and it would be filled with smoke. And I couldn't open the window because they said there was a draft. Funny scene. But anyway, that was kind of it. I drove them quite often. There was times when I would sit out in the car. They would go in for a meeting that I wasn't allowed to attend. I wasn't a made guy at that point. And I'd sit there and wait sometimes two, three, four hours for them to come out. At night, uh, quite often, at, towards the end of the day, we'd go for dinner. Uh, dinner would be hosted. Some of the recruits, some not, you know, some other people that maybe they wanted to meet. We'd sit around. We'd always go to a, a, a decent restaurant, have a bite to eat. And then at some point in time, we might go to a club that night, all associate together. Um, and during this time, I'm absorbing what the life is really all about. And I'm waiting because at any moment I could be told, this is something you need to do. I could be given an order. And sometimes it was uh, about something serious. Sometimes it wasn't that serious. But basically, my day as a recruit was getting down to Brooklyn in the morning, normally Carroll Street or wherever I was designated to go. There were times when, you know, my Kappa regime lived in Long Island, so I'd have to pick him up and drive in with him. But basically, it was just being on call 24-7 for whatever I was asked to do. It was a little bit difficult because at the same time, I'm trying to earn a living. You know, and uh, I think in a, in a prior video I had told you, you know, I, I uh, had gotten myself in trouble. I went to trial a number of times. I was trying to build my life back. I told you in another video I was working weekends uh, for a fellow by the name of Vinny Vingo, who was an associate at the flea market. Told you all about that. You can look it up in another video, a recent one. And so basically, though, I was on call. And there were times, people, as a recruit, that I was given something to do to prove myself worthy. I'm not going to get into detail, use your imagination, but uh, uh, there is no way that you enter that life without proving yourself. doesn't matter if you're somebody's son. There's a lot of sons of fathers that uh, are part of that life. Andrew Russo brought his sons in. Persico brought his sons in. Colombo brought his sons in. You name it, there's a lot of nepotism in that life. And it doesn't matter who your father is. You still must prove yourself in that life in one way or another. Again, use your imagination. So that's basically my life as a recruit. And that lasted for me for about two years. And it is taxing. And I lived on Long Island. I had to get into to Brooklyn uh, just about every day. And, uh, you know, it was tough. But, hey, this is what I wanted. And I had to prove myself. And I was there on call 24-7. So cut to Halloween night, 1975, the night that I got made with five other guys. So now I'm a soldier in the family. Okay. Uh, obviously, my, uh, my ranking increases because now I'm a made guy. I have privileges that I didn't have before. So I'm allowed more than, than not to, uh, to go about my business. Now, you kind of find your way at that point in time. You know, my cop regime was still Andrew Russo. And by the way, I love Andrew. He was a great guy, and uh, I have no ill feeling what, towards him whatsoever. He was very fair with me. I got along well with him. And I know he's a little bit elderly now, and, and I always wish him and his family the best. He was a, a, just a good guy, him and his whole family. And um, he was good with me. You know, when I needed something, he was there for me. I had to put everything that I was doing on record with him. And the reason you do that, when I say on record, you don't write it down, but you have to tell your official, your capo regime, this is what I'm involved in, whether it be legitimate or illegitimate. Because if it's legitimate and somebody makes a claim on your business and you don't have it on record and you sit down and there's an argument about it, you could lose the argument just because you didn't put it on record. 
If it's an illegal activity, whether it be bookmaking, shylocking, you know, hijack, anything that you might do that's illegal, if you don't put that on record with your cop regime and there is a claim or a sit down or an argument, uh, something with another made guy and it wasn't on record, you could lose the argument because you never put it on record. So you must put everything you're doing as a soldier and even as a recruit on record. So again, answer to my cop regime, I'd get up in the morning. Um, if I was needed, I'd run downtown, but I didn't have to do it as often. But a lot of times I did get a call, come around, Michael, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. So you're still always on call as a soldier. The second thing is now, uh, now I start earning money. So when I'm earning money, again, go to my cop regime. This is the deal I got. Here's the money that I'm turning in. And uh, uh, you have to do that. And it was more or less during my time as a soldier, even a little bit as a recruit, but more as a soldier, that I kind of found my way and they kind of saw me as an earner in that life. And in that life, you kind of separate yourself, people. There's people that earn and uh, they're valuable, obviously, because the family's got to make money. You know, the Colombo family, especially, we we're always known as more as the tough guys. Uh, when, I mean, when I mean tough guys, I mean, I'm not saying we're tougher than anybody else, but uh, we weren't the business crew, so to speak, really. We had, you know, several wars in our family. Uh, we had one of the smaller families. I think we had 115 made guys at the time uh, that I spent in that life where Gambinos and Genovese, they had over 200, maybe 250. But the Bonanos and, and our family, we were a little bit smaller in that regard. Uh, Lucchese also a little bit smaller. But um, so I established myself as an earner, started to bring in money. I knew, I, I knew how to use that life to benefit me in business. I was very aggressive, went out on the street and did my best to earn for the family. And as a result of that, uh, I started to, you know, rise in stature because, listen, money means a lot in that life. And, you know, you bringing it in, you supporting the family in a certain way, it works out well. And so that was it. So, but I also had my own business during that time as a soldier. I established my automobile uh, dealerships. I had a Mazda dealership. I also had a... Um, uh, Chevrolet dealership out in Suffolk County, Long Island. I had leasing companies. And, uh, but let me get into my, 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 really my daily routine. It was, I'd get up in the morning. I'm always an early riser, up five, six in the morning. I'd have breakfast with my family during that time. And then boom, somebody would normally pick me up. I usually wouldn't drive. I'd go to my offices in the morning if I didn't have to go right to Brooklyn, either the Chevrolet dealership, the Mazda agency, that's where my offices were. I'd conduct my business there, the legitimate stuff that I had to do in business that it called for. And then if needed, I'd head downtown in the afternoons quite often, meet with my cop regime, Andrew, maybe the boss, <clears throat> get through whatever mob business had to be done at that point in time. Later on in the day, I would always make sure that I got home for dinner sit down, eat dinner, you know, spend time with the kids. And then again, seven, eight, nine, ten o'clock, I'm out again. We used to go to a club almost every night. I had my whole crew around me. We would sit down, discuss our business. I mean, it was a, uh, a, a very busy day. I never was bored. I never had nothing to do. I can tell you that uh, because I had guys that were uh, in my crew, so to speak, around me, they were always trying to get something going business-wise, so I was always dealing with them one way or the other. It became a big responsibility, even as a soldier. Cut two, I become a cop regime. 1980, I'm appointed officially. Before that, I was acting cop for my dad uh, when he came home. And, you know, that's another whole thing. I mean, I can, you know, sit here for, for hours to tell you about my relationship with my dad and things that we had to do together. Um, but as a cop regime, now it's different. Now you're assigned men. It is an official position. You know, when people have said to me, Michael, why do you call yourself a boss? I don't call myself a boss. The media calls me a boss. Everybody else calls me a boss. But when you're a cop regime, you are a boss. You're in charge of men. You're not the boss of the family, but you're a street boss. The men uh, are assigned to you by the boss. The soldiers are. You also have your associates and you're responsible for them and they're responsible to you. So that's a leadership position. You know, it's, it is what it is. So that's why people call it a boss. Um, but I had a lot of responsibility. I mean, it was a lot of work. And then dealing with your guys who are always, you know, I don't want to say in trouble, but they always have something going on that you have to deal with. You know, as a cop regime, you're always dealing with something uh, with your associates or with your, your uh, soldiers that are under you. Uh, it was just very involved. And I would do that throughout the day. If I had to go downtown to see the boss, obviously I'd meet with him. 
uh, and we would do our mob business, you know, Michael, this is what we need you to do. And, you know, sometimes I had to do certain things and get my crew involved. Uh, a lot of stuff. Again, get home for dinner, tried my best to do that, uh, spend time with, uh, with my family, and then always 9 30, 10 o'clock out again. And yes, we used to be in a club just about every night. That was it, five, six nights a week. We'd be in a club till maybe one, two, three in the morning. Um, you know, we would party a little bit. We talk business quite often in the clubs. And I used to go to all of them, a couple on Long Island, Channel 80, 231. In the city, we'd go to Regine's, uh, Studio 54 at times. I mean, just a lot of the clubs, I'm not mentioning all of them, but uh, that was my life, you know, five, six days a week. I tell my kids, you could never be in a club as often as dad was because during my time in that life, that was it. And yes, a lot of mob guys did that. We, we, we just spent our nights out like that. So <clears throat> that was, uh, that was kind of it. And I always tried to spend Sunday at home. You know, Sunday was kind of family day and, um, you know, holidays, obviously family days. So that's it for today. Um, man, I do hope you're getting into the Christmas spirit. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, we're in lockdown here again in California, you know, under almost house arrest, I would call it. But, you know, we're getting through it. Listen, I don't want to minimize uh, the seriousness of this virus. It is serious. A lot of people are catching it. You know, try to take the politics aside. I don't know if they're doing the right thing, but with these lockdowns, I feel bad for many of the restaurants that are struggling, that are never going to open up again. I'll tell you, I was at uh, Westwood, California, where UCLA is. Big town, very affluent town on Monday, and I was shocked to see all the, uh, uh, the storefronts that were boarded up and closed and empty. Uh, it's terrible. I know people are struggling. I just hope that this government figures something out. I hope that people get the uh, aid that they need to get uh, because it's sad, you know, and I know a lot of people are depressed and I know a lot of people are going through stuff. Hey, uh, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. You have to have that attitude, people. So I hope you do. Take care of your families through this time of the year. Try to be as as uh, joyous as you possibly can. For those of you that are believers like I am, it's a time to be thankful just to be alive and free and, you know, above the ground, I would say. We have a lot to celebrate uh, on our Lord's birthday on December 25th. So that's it for today. How do I always leave you? Be safe, be healthy, and God bless you. And I'll see you next time.